Okay, my name is Denise Parker, and I'm a uh, pleasure to chair this session, Sports Governance, Remedies for Change. We have four presenters this morning. Uh, Sport Integrity, Past, Present, and Future by Mike McNamee, Mac McNamee, professor at Swanee University. Definitional Clarity of Sports-Related Corruption, presented by Simon Gardner, Professor Leeds Beckett University. Governance in National Sport Organizations, The Perspective of Modernization, by Sabrina Furtado, PhD student at Federal University of Parma. And Code of Good Governance and Academy of Sport Management, Tools for Reform of Sport in Poland, by Greg Botwina, Head of Department, Institute of Sport, National Research Institute. So we have 10 minutes for each presenter, um, and then we will wait for all the presentations and then have Q&A after. 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we will start with Mike. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, Today's talk, I was hoping, was going to be talking about a project I did um, along with my co-authors for UK Anti-Doping. Uh, but uh, the project hasn't been launched yet, so I'm going to speak to slightly more general themes uh, because the conference uh, has used the word sport integrity a million times, but I'm not at all clear that people are talking about the same thing when they're talking about it. So I want to do a little bit of uh, conceptual analysis, a little bit of clarification and then some thoughts about where I think we are and where we might be. So when everybody talks about sport integrity, um, there's usually some kind of mixed focus. Part of the focus is on the corrupt individuals. Perhaps a lot of the media focuses on those. Academics and some journalists are focused also on the structures that, in, uh, that, that enable that kind of corruption. The sport federations themselves, of course, partly go through denial. They partly try to keep it internal and trying to uh, control the media and message flow. They try to do their own piece of image management. And in most cases, we get skin deep reforms with limited government uh, effects. And part of the problem, I think, is, is that once you're initiated into the sports system, you become enculturated into a set of ways of being, believing, acting, speaking and you become normalised, and lots of the challenges to some of our uh, athlete advocates and representatives is that they too become normalised into the system. So that crucial word independence uh, keeps raising its ugly head. Uh, independence, impartiality and integrity are three words that are used, I think, almost interchangeably and very problematically so. But in the academic literature, there is no consensus on what sport integrity actually means. There are at least three different interconnected conceptions. And I think in many instances, more than one of these conceptions is operational at the same time. But I think for the purposes of clarity, we need analytical distinction. So sometimes when people are talking about it's an integrity matter, they're really just talking about the personal integrity of the person involved. On other cases, they're talking about the organizational integrity the stated aims and purposes of that organisation. Are they being carried out in practice or is there some kind of discontinuity between stated aims and actual practices? And then there's some cases, like the Semenya case discussed yesterday, which is a question of competition integrity. Does this athletic contest indeed set out to establish the things that the sport is supposed to establish? Like, is this the best female 800 metre runner or not? So in operational terms, um, these are very often coming together and we need to be distinct and clear about them. Because what seems clear to me is that some people uh, would say that competition integrity just isn't our brief, whereas international federations are the federations who set the laws and preserve the integrity of the competition. They also have considerable influence in organisational integrity, but personal integrity is something that they tend to leave to the lawyers. Now, uh, if we look at how integrity is actually practiced, I've got two, two logos here and I want to draw out some distinction between the approaches in sport integrity. So firstly, most commercial organizations, I think, see sport integrity really as, an, as a reputational brand threat. Not necessarily as something they really want to promote, but something they've got to be on their guard against. As I've said, there is considerable uh, uh, conceptual lack of clarity as to what sport integrity is, and therefore what an integrity threat might be. 
I've made the distinction in the literature between narrow and broad sport integrity. And, and let me just quickly exemplify it here. So if you talk to UEFA, for example, when they're talking about sport integrity or football integrity, they're really talking about match fixing and nothing else. Whereas if you look at the Australian uh, national response to the sport integrity problem, which arose out of the cricketing scandal, they have 13 different items in their list of what constitutes sport integrity. And I think that's just a case of conceptual inflation. It's really not helpful. And how one operationalizes so diverse a range of threats strikes me as uh, impossible. Now, when uh, UK had asked me to map the landscape of, of sport integrity in the UK, I think I had to draw attention to the following problem. If I was drawing the landscape outside the front of the hotel, it would be quite easy because it's a fixed space. But when you questionnaire 65 different organisations in UK sport, as I did, you find they're all talking about different kinds of maps. So trying to compare and contrast them is extremely problematic. So, sport integrity is not a landscape out there waiting to be mapped. It's a fluid moving affair. For my own part, this looks like a core list of, of items, but you might dispute it. Anti-doping, event manipulation, safeguarding, other forms of wrongdoing and exclusionary practices. I think that looks to me like the core of what any sport integrity programme or agenda should look like. The difficulty is, of course, that some of it is going to be driven by a particular sport. Tennis integrity is obviously going to be driven by tanking and match fixing because that's its number one problem. But there are other cases, such as national responses, which will develop their own agenda in combination with politics. Now, this is going to give us a huge problem because under such conditions, you have enormous strategic uncertainty. How do you set about strategically addressing integrity threats when you're not even clear what constitutes an integrity threat? Or when different organisations or different states all have their own bag of integrity threats? And like David, who mentioned the possibility of a World Sport Integrity Agency, I chaired a meeting for MINEPS, the, 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 the World Forum of Ministers of Sport and Physical Education, around about seven years ago in UNESCO in Paris. And every stakeholder around that table, the first word out of their mouth was, we're not having another water. Now, I'm not sure they would say that now. Seven, eight years on, I'm not sure that would be their position. The, the problem we're still left with is, is who owns the integrity agenda then? Now, you, you might complain that uh, there's, in the absence of some international coordinating agency, there is no, going to be no strategically effective responses, but who's going to own it and who's going to fund it? The WADA have a hard enough time getting the money out of states' parties now to fund the World Anti-Doping Agency. Uh, kill the IOC if you want to, but they tend to pay on time their 50% of WADA's funding. Some governments do, some governments don't. If they're not going to do it for anti-doping, are they really going to do it for this loose thing called sport integrity? I'm not really sure. What I do know, though, is that this problem is an international problem, and if we just take match fixing, the kind of international, legal, and criminal agency collaboration that's required is incredible, and they do not exist at present, the data sharing arrangements, to effectively prosecute that agenda. And what's worse for me, as a professor of ethics, the word integrity is being used an awful lot lately, but the word ethics seem to have dropped out of the scene. So, uh, what are we looking like uh, in the future? I've got a couple of slides now where I'm just going to throw out ideas, partly that came out of the research, partly that came out of my reflections in trying to design a postgraduate curriculum for sport, ethics and integrity. So, I think we need a national, some kind of national coordinating agency. Maybe that's not going to be the first step. Maybe that's going to be the fruit of some kind of national forum where people get around a table in a way that they're not threatening each other and are prepared to share the agenda. Uh, they need, as the first priority, to produce a national strategic sport integrity plan. Most organisations cannot afford integrity officers. Now, I designed a two-year master programme to develop sport integrity officers with philosophy, ethics, law, governance and management because I think those are the five disciplines that you need to do the job properly. How many sports in the UK alone, which is quite a wealthy country, could afford to have a sport integrity officer? Full-time? I don't know. I don't know. Six, seven, eight, ten, twelve. The whole of the Premier Football League could, no problem. And if they did, that would create a huge cascading effect where other people would say, 
We need to copy football, soccer, as you, as you say. Um, the trouble is investigating any kind of integrity threat. No sport has investigatory powers of a serious legal kind. So there's going to have to be collaborative relationships made with police agencies. Beneath that level, people will work on networks. And I think those networks could be quite important because I'm trying to work out what's the relationship going to be between states parties, state funded sports, highly commercialized sports. You have an extremely complicated mixture, a pastiche of different kinds of organizations that somehow are going to need to work together. And I suspect it's going to be on collegial networks that it will start with first before we have strategic partnerships involved. I do think that the World Integrity Agency needs to happen. It probably won't happen for the next five years. And I'm not sure if you're going to have the national agencies drive an international agenda or whether you need first an international agenda to cascade down international agendas. That's going to be an interesting political exercise. If you look at those integrity positions that are currently available, they tend to be peopled by people with legal backgrounds, and I think that's a problem, because uh, lawyers tend to see every ethical problem as a legal problem. That's not to deride the, the importance and nature of legal interventions in sport governance, not at all. But lawyers will tend to see problems like lawyers. And that's great if you're operating in a country like Australia, which has, for example, a national law against match fixing. But nearly every country in the world doesn't have such a law. So we need to use a different set of toolkits. We certainly need to think about what levels of integrity, threats, and which kinds of unethical behaviours can just be dealt with by cheaper and quicker alternative dispute resolution. Great comment yesterday, which says, one of the problems with advocating safe sport alongside an, an ADR, alternative dispute resolution process, is there's no transparency. It's not reported, and I think that's a really <coughs> important point. But nevertheless, how many people can go to CAS when they hit a big problem? Very few people. And the stacks are going to be odds. They're going to be stacked against individual athletes. So we do need to look at other extra-legal processes when we're considering integrity threats and what to do with them. Crucially, we need to get this balance right between education um, and regulation. I mean, the betting integrity failures of athletes are well known. But the betting companies are really quick to point the, uh, point the, the finger at the athletes. Really quick. Well, in some cases, these are the victims. So I, I want to see a, a much more emboldened approach to edu education. Uh, I think the quickest way to develop capacity is to look at really good student programs and start to build effective internship relationships. Three of, three of, my, three of the students of my 50 over the two years went to the British Horse Racing Authority. One to do stuff on legal and irregular bank gambling, one to do stuff on safeguarding, one to do stuff on match fixing. That organisation knows it's got a problem and it's prepared to invite interns in on a confidentiality uh, disclosure agreement in order to try to bring up expertise. Because even a wealthy organisation like them can't afford yet to have a massive team. Tennis Integrity Unit's going to have about 20 officers. Athletics Integrity Unit has about 20 officers, full-time people. But this is a model for wealthy organisations not the most of the organisations in the world. So, um, I'll finish there, but I would just say, one of the ways in which I hope that I can help do this, we have 50 postgraduate students, most of whom are funded by the European Commission. Yeah, we're developing their capacity, but they all want to do research projects, and there should be lots of people around here that are interested in research getting done, but who don't have the money to pay for it. So. If you do have some kind of integrity agenda, you need explored research, we have students from about 45 different countries in the world on our programme. Please do see me if you think we can help you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just going to um, go ahead quite a long way on these slides because uh, I lost my PowerPoint presentation. I had to um, uh, use an old one and uh, adapt it. Um, I'm a sports lawyer, I guess, primarily, although I come from also a kind of chronological background. And it's interesting what Mike uh, says that uh, um, lawyers tend to see sports 
ethics issues in terms of a, a legal solution or legal uh, framework. I guess I try and understand um, uh, issues uh, that are kind of legal in nature to actually try and understand the ethical underlying uh, elements. And uh, that's really led me to um, start to look at uh, some issues around conceptual clarity in this area. Um, and I had um, a, a really good experience uh, two or three years ago to work with um, a colleague of, of uh, Mike's, uh, Professor Jim Parry, and also a colleague of mine at Leeds Becker University, uh, Professor Simon Robinson, uh, who both come from an uh, ethicist background, um, to start to look at the issue of integrity and to um, focus really on uh, values and behaviour and to try and look at how integrity operates in other public and private organisations outside sport. And I think one of the failures of sport is to learn um, from experiences outside of its uh, own domain. Um, that led me on to think about issues around corruption and conceptual clarity around how we understand corruption in sport. And um, my paper really comes out of a um, piece of published work uh, that I completed a couple of years ago, um, and it was in a book edited by um, Lisa Kyle, who was uh, just chairing the last session. Um, and I think the, the framework of the book was to uh, attempt to try and understand more about corruption in sport as a phenomenon. And I was asked to provide a bit of um, conceptual clarity around how corruption could be defined or understood. I guess the chapter is essentially a literature review to a large extent, um, but I try to kind of make sense of, of different competing um, disciplinary viewpoints around corruption. And really it was from the position that corruption is under-theorised and conceptualised within sport. Again, like integrity, it's a term that is used, banded around and used in a very loose way. So it was really an attempt to provide some definition of clarity. And where I started was to try and, and look at how we understand corruption generally in society. And it's quite an eye-opener to me that actually as a phenomenon, um, you know, there is not a great history of study around corruption. Uh, you know, we really see it as quite a modern concept. Um, corruption in uh, public organisations, corruption in, in private bodies. Um, so I started really from a philosophical perspective, um, looking at uh, the origin of the word that is about decay, um, something rotten, something that is um, also about immoral behaviour. We know that Transparency International is a, a body, and, uh, national um, non-governmental body has um, you know, been quite influential in trying to uh, understand. We talked about the abuse of untrusted power for private gain. And I think three factors come out of that, a breakdown in meaning of how we understand things, deception, and a breakdown in trust. Secondly, I looked at it from a, a legal regulatory perspective, and uh, again, you know, we don't go back that far uh, to find the first conventions around um, corruption, um, really occurring in, in the 1960s and 70s, and I think one of the best comes from the South African Development Community Protocol Against Corruption, and you've got the uh, definition there. Uh, both including and, and, and encompassing public and private actors. The third main perspective was to try and understand it as a, a sociological phenomenon from a chronological perspective. Um, and really what comes out of the literature is that uh, corruption is not only significantly contested but an under-theorised concept in chronology. Um, uh, but there is a close connection between corrupt activity and organised crime and organised uh, criminal gangs. If any of you come from a criminological background, you know that that itself, organised crime, is um, quite a, 
a contested and uncertain uh, concept. And again, a term that is used very loosely uh, in the academic literature and actually in uh, public discourse. So then I started to look at how those general definitions could be applied to sport and how sport has developed its own understanding of sports-related corruption. And it comes from similar backgrounds, um, but certainly from a sports management perspective, a number of uh, authors have attempted to try and provide an understanding. Um, Manning would be one of the uh, leading individuals who made a clear distinction between competition corruption, uh, competition governance issues around how the sport is played, and management corruption uh, in terms of uh, the organization around sport. Interestingly, he excluded doping from his understanding of sports-related corruption where he saw that doping was essentially about um, super performing, improving your uh, individual um, uh, physiological activity, whereas most corruption is about trying to uh, reduce the effectiveness of uh, the organization um, and uh, athletic behavior. Gorson Chadwick uh, produced some work um, in 2012, really from a sports marketing perspective, to um, understand the amount of corruption going on in contemporary sport. And I guess really looking at you know what was the you know the financial impact of that. And this was really an attempt to look at process and adjudication where it could be seen that there was an investigation and um, some sort of action taken against uh, an individual or individuals. Uh, a case, I guess, in other words, um, that would be uh, what they would see as kind of identifiable evidence of corruption occurring. But of course, uh, I think uh, there was an acceptance in the work that uh, there's a dark figure of corrupt activity in sport, and I think it was mentioned in the uh, previous session, uh, that we simply don't hear about, it's not detected, and it isn't going to end up as um, any kind of formal action that can be measured. They um, viewed that cheating shouldn't be involved in uh, their definition, that um, sports-related uh, actions against individuals or organisations would be um, quite often quite uh, minimal uh, and difficult to measure in any kind of systemised way. Um, and then I looked at uh, an emerging subdiscipline in terms of sports criminology, and um, this source from Brooks, Button, and Azim, which was um, uh, a publication uh, really making a distinction between corrupt activity that would amount to unlawful action, um, fraud in other words, and fraud has a, a basis in criminal uh, legal um, frameworks, it's legally defined in most jurisdictions whereas corruption isn't. So they were happy that you know, fraud, real um, deception uh, intended to provide um, individual gain, um, was clearly identifiable as a form of corruption, um, but they saw a, a wider continuum beyond that and they were happy to include cheating within that continuum. Fraud at one end, clearly identifiable, unlawful, and then corrupt activity of a more minimal nature. So out of this um, analysis and, and examination of the literature, I tried to come up with what I kind of saw as encompassing um, these different perspectives, uh, a model of sports-related corruption um, where there is a core of certainty, where we have clear financial corruption that would amount to fraud, we have serious doping uh, that probably will also amount to uh, a legal liability, uh, where we've got 
corrupt activity being characterized as illegality. Beyond that, there is a penumbra of uncertainty where we've got minor fi uh, financial corruption that wouldn't generally amount uh, to uh, unlawful acts. Um, more uh, mainstream forms of doping, which generally isn't about illegal substances, and where the sporting response is through disciplinary measures and not through a legal measure. Um, the distinction between those uh, areas is um, one that is, I think, quite permeable uh, and is, you know, perhaps a challenge to determine where individual situations will uh, be located within that model. That's where my work kind of ended, and really in, in the paper, just to finish off 30 seconds, um, I kind of made a call that, you know, we need more research in this area, we need more empirical-based, evidence-based research. And I guess, you know, one of my calls to people in the room and to the uh, readership of the article was, you know, how are we going to move the agenda ahead in this? And, you know, that's what I'm, I guess, at a point to try and, you know, determine how you know, I can move uh, to develop a more empirical uh, based, uh, evidence-based uh, approach to try to tease out these uh, uncertainties about how we understand corruption. Thank you. Sabrina Furtado, uh, and I am a PhD student in Federal University of Paraná, which is in Brazil. So we're going to change a little bit the English accent that you are listening to. <laughs> Hope you guys can understand me. Uh, I am also a member of Inteligência Esportiva Institute, which you on is also located in Brazil. So the presentation that I'm showing you today is based on the project of my thesis. Uh, I'm working with Professor Fernando Mezadri, who's there, and Professor Thiago Santos. They are my advisor and my co-advisor. So, my work is based on the perspective of the modernization as a component of governance in national sports organizations. Our idea is to develop a framework to analyze the process of modernization in national sports organizations. So, this work is still under development, so what I brought here today are the initial findings that are helping us to shape this study. So we have been following the rays of the debate about governance in sports organizations in the academic field. This trend could be related to the need to adoption of better practices of management by these organizations. So some of the changes that have been occurring in national sports organizations management are a response to the pressure of their stakeholders. These stakeholders could be, but they are not limited to, sponsors, athletes, media, government, and the society as well. So all these stakeholders want and they wish for is that the sponsor organizations become more reliable. So in the academic field, the governance in sports organizations have been analyzed by three different but interrelated axes. They are political governance, organizational governance, and systemic governance. The organizational governance is related to the management practices and dynamics adopted by the institutions. And so, most of the frameworks outlined to analyze the adoption of governance principles by the NSOs, they are linked to the organizational governance. So, it is where most of the researchers could better understand and quantify the implications of the adoption of governance practices by the sport institutions. And we have been seeing this like from yesterday in the SGO results. So, like I told before, it is well known that national sports organizations are work to make their institutions more reliable to their stakeholders. At least some of them are. And this has happened for so many reasons we could say to raise their foundings, to be in accordance with national laws, to raise their sports in their own countries. And in Brazil, for example, the national sports organizations, they are forced to act according to governance principles in order to be able to reach public funding. 
So, what we have been seeing is that the adoption of these codes of governance, most of the time, are forced by external factors to the national sports organizations. And it leads the management practices of these institutions to the business-like principles. All these changes, they are operated by the national sports organizations in their structure and management practices. And all these changes, they could be seen as a modernization of these organizations. And we, could, we can say that because researchers have been discussing the modifications of the ways that national sports organizations operate their management and perceive that the modernization of them is related to improvement of their servers in order to reach greater efficiency and effectiveness of their own management. With the modernization of their management, these organizations are using business practices to measure their results, set their goals, and evaluate their service delivery. But despite the importance of the discussion about the modernization process in national sports organization, there is still a lake of studies that focus in this area. So the concept about what is modernization in national sports organization is not clear yet. And also the components that could compose the notion of modernization as a principle of governance in sports organizations could be better defined. So in this sense, the aim of our study is to discuss the principles that might constitute the notion of modernization in national sports organizations, while an indicator of good governance, and in what way this practice can positively impact on performance of this of I'm sorry, on the performance of the management of these institutions. So what we have till now from the theory studios that analyze this field is that it is possible to note that one important aspect of this process is the approach of the business techniques in the management of these organizations. So some new terms that start to show up in national sports organizations are like strategic planning, strategic goal, the use of key performance indicators, and so on. Another similarity that these studies have been pointing out is about the reasons why national sports organizations have been changing or modernizing they, their management. In some of the cases, this, these changes have been demanded by financial institutions, which ones are, in most of the cases, the government, the major founding body of national sports organizations. This is also the case in Brazil, where through legislation, legislation changes and updates, the government demands adjustments in management of the sports organizations. So, after analyzing the studies about modernization in national sports organization, it was possible to light up some principles that could be arranged in a framework in order to analyze the process of modernization and its impact in the management performance of these institutions. So, we believe that it is possible to analyze the impact of modernization in national sports organizations by two different but interrelated perspectives. The first one is the one linked to business-like elements and the emphasis in commercial type considerations of finance and strategy in sport institutions. So these ones are the ones that you are seeing here. They are linked to the performance of management in organizations. And it is the first perspective that we can find out. So here we have some like the use of key performance indicators, clarification of their organization strategic focus, key personal turnover. Yesterday, some of the, the speeches talking about the importance of the people that work in the, in the sports organization institutions, and we found this is really important in the modernization process in these institutions. The other perspective that we found is linked to the boards of national sports organizations, so the composition of these boards, their holes, the skills that their components should have, and so on. Like the first one that we point out here is the separate holes of the chairman and the CEO in the sports organizations. We, stu we still don't have it in Brazil, so like from the last year, some of national sports organizations start to change, but yet it's not common. It, I think that's pretty far away to become a real, uh, a real situation in Brazil. 
So together, this board and the previous one could be understood as principles that could move the national sports organization towards modernization. So the data presented here light up some principles that would be arranged as a framework to measure the modernization of national sports organizations in order to analyze how this modernization could impact the organizational performance of these institutions. In this sense, it is expected that by leveraging the modernization of national sports organizations, it would enhance the management of them and it would make these institutions more trustable for its stakeholders as for the society. As well, the non-adoption of these practices could negatively impact organizations by making room for corruption, corrupt practices, lot of loss of sponsors, and problems with rising funding by them. So we strongly recommend more research about the modernization process in national sports organizations in order to better understand this process and its impact in the sports organizations. So, like I told in the beginning, uh, this is an under development project yet, so any feedbacks or questions that you might have are pretty welcome. Thank you very much. Obrigada. My name is Greg Botvina, and um, I'm from the um, Institute of Sport National, National Research Institute from Poland. <clears throat> and I'm really happy that we have question and answer after my speech, because otherwise I would be the only thing standing between you and lunch, so that would be really dangerous. Um, anyways, I'll, be, um, I'll try to be quite brief. Uh, so. I'll be talking about the um, Code of Good Governance and the um, Academy for Sport Management uh, in Poland as tools introduced um, to support the um, national governing bodies um, in the reform of their um, operations. Um, so first, to, to give you a brief um, intro into how is it in Poland, because um, I'm quite aware there's no one from Poland in here, so maybe you're not very aware how does it look. Uh, so um, NGBs are basically uh, funded by the, um, by the government. So uh, most of the federations receive between around 90% of their, their yearly budget from, from the state. Okay, there are some exceptions, which is football, as we are in the US now, it's soccer. Uh, uh, then uh, golf federation and then motorsports. Um, so, as good governance is, uh, you know, um, an issue in the uh, in the last several years in sports, uh, there was a research commissioned by the Ministry of Sports uh, in Poland um, in 2015. It was uh, the research was done in 2015, delivered in 2016. Um, so what it shows that we have lack of um, managers with background in uh, management, actually, in law, in economics, in finance, um, managing the NGBs. And in some cases, when we are talking about organizations we, which have, um, you know, few thousand volunteers or mm, workers or however we, we call them, um, working for them in uh, budgets uh, with the range of uh, large enterprise, sometimes it's just difficult for them to manage such an organization. Um, and what we see that it's just like 5% of those guys who have uh, background um, in this domain. And then mm, more than 70% of them uh, have background in sports, in physical education, coaching. So, um, we clearly see that it's, in some cases, it might be not that they have um, that wheel of running the organization, they just lack the competencies to, to do so, lack the knowledge and skills um, to run such a, such a big um, operation. Huh? 
And then, uh, as we are at the Play the Game conference, uh, I will bring the um, National Sport Governance Observer that um, was conducted in Poland, also as one of the uh, um, one of the countries in 2018, in 2015 also. But I'll just bring 2018. So uh, Poland came up as the last pack one. Uh, we were. Um, just Cyprus was worse than us. Um, obviously, the scale is different. Uh, nevertheless, we had 38% of the points. And uh, basically, it was only because the Football Federation was participating and was really rising the, the number of points that we, that we reached. So otherwise, we would be probably the last one. Um, so that's the... Um, what we what we saw in 2016, um, and then in 2017, uh, after seeing that report, um, our government decided that something has to be done, uh, and um, so they prepared, uh, started preparing the reform, and which was introduced at the beginning of 2018, with the change of legislation on sports. Um, I'll just just bring some. Just a few points because it was quite a quite a, a, a major reform, but it was putting a lot of emphasis on, on transparency, on good governance, on uh, um, the thing that was brought up today in the in terms of um, uh, of uh, skiing that um, they had a president for 47 years. Uh, so uh, also the limitation of terms for for board members to. Um, you know, to make it easier for the newcomers. Um, and then also with the change of law, uh, there were two other uh, things that were introduced um, at the same time at the beginning of 2018. One was the code of good governance for um, NGBs, and the second one was uh, Academy of Sport Management. So first, the code of good governance. It's, you know, most of you were there at the um, previous panel, and Dick Pound said, um, what is good governance? And that's the first question. And um, the other thing is, if what we understand is good governance, the guys on the other side also understand the same. Okay, so it's, it's really important to just make sure that both the, um, you know, the, the body that is in charge of sports and the national governing bodies in the country, they're on the same page. Because if they're not, it's kind of to, I'm saying that we have good governance and you're saying we do not. And where's the truth? Probably both sides, right? Um, if we do not have the um, common definitions. So the code of good governance is, uh, is a document introduced by, by the government, by the Minister of Sports. But it's not a legally binding document, okay? So it's not a legislation. Um, it's just a, uh, um, a combination of 183 guidelines um, put into 12 areas, such as strategy, athletes, involvement, um, transparency, finances, and so on. And um, we have three types of guidelines. So. One of them is obligatory, um, so NGBs have to um, introduce them. Second one is partially obligatory, so um, in some cases, so for example, if um, the grant from the government exceeds certain uh, amount of money, you have to introduce them. If it doesn't or your organization is very small, you don't have to introduce them, and some of them are voluntary. Um, and then one thing that was also introduced with the Code of Good Governance that um, compliance with it means that you will receive funding or not. So that was the idea. I will get back to it at the end. Right, and then as previously mentioned, we have the issue of the managers uh, who do not have the background in management. So sometimes it might be difficult for them to understand a document which is over 100 pages written, you know, with legal terms. Uh, so 
we decided to, to start uh, an academy for sport management to support the um, NGBs, not only to, to tell them that they are really, you know, sometimes bad in what they're doing, but to just also support in the, um, in the reform. Um, so the Academy of Sport Management is a, is a state-funded pro uh, project. Um, it's a non-formal education project which uh, is aimed at the um, top management, so board members and the um, secretary generals and directors of the national governing bodies, um, with workshops and, and seminars each month. And by now, uh, the Academy conducted more than 1,000 uh, training mandates uh, for NGBs. Uh, and then that's one thing. But the other thing that, that was mentioned also at the, at the conference uh, early on that the um, sport is really unique, that everybody thinks that um, their organization is, is very unique, that there is no similar points between, between the organization, which is usually not true because um, most of the, of the sport organizations are first facing similar pro uh, problems probably at different stages of, of development, but they face similar, similar issues. So what's really important in that project is sharing of uh, knowledge and experience among the participants, um, which brings a lot of, a lot of added value for, for that reform and um, bringing those organizations in a really good direction. And then, um, Another thing with the academy is that there is 50% 50, 50 ratio of practitioners and academics. So uh, sometimes the issue is with the academics that they really they are really good with delivering knowledge, but it's really difficult to apply it. And then on the other hand, it's difficult for the practitioners sometimes to deliver the knowledge to adults in a way that they can really well comprehend it and, and use it later on. So we decided to, 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 to do it like that. And then, to, to sum it up, um, there are several issues with the reform. So, um, as I mentioned, the, 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 the thing with um, lack of uh, knowledge in the area of management and the code, even though uh, one of the participants today, uh, Louis, told me that the code looks really, really nice when you look at it um, graphically. But then it's quite long, okay? It's like more than 100 pages. Um, and it's written in, in quite legal um, terms. So it's quite long and complicated. So, so some of the federations are, are, are struggling with, with understanding it. Um, and then NGBs are quite hesitant, you know, as, as usual as the organization when there is change to be made. Um, the organization usually trying to keep the status quo. That's nothing unusual. Um, but then the issue is that there is no clear strategy for implementation. And, and you're, you're, when you're making a reform um, and then you're just bringing things and then you have no clear strategy how to implement it and execute it, sometimes it's just uh, not enough. Um, yeah, and then the threat, what I mentioned, that if the NGBs are non-compliant, uh, there is uh, this threat of um, lowering the government spending, but this is um, unfortunately not executed. So even though there is a code and um, you know, the, the idea behind this really is, is really good, then if you just stop at a certain moment with the reform and you're not going through with it, because you know, obviously when there is politics involved, uh, you have to think about being elected for a second term, right, or, or, or so on. Um, then um, lowering the spending for the NGBs is really a difficult topic to be discussed. All right, and that's basically sums. So. All right, thank you to all the presenters. It is time for questions from uh, the group. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone around. 
got one here. Thank you. Hello. My name is Mauricio. I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello. Okay. No, it wasn't. Now it is. <laughs> now, uh, no, no, no. Okay. My name is uh, Mauricio. No, I am from Colombia. Uh, my question is for uh, Sabrina. Yeah. Um, are you introducing a new mantra in the sport movement, which is modernization? For me, modernization is the same as good governance. Could you tell us a little bit more about if it's the same or if it's different? Thank you. Well, actually, I'm not introducing <laughs> modernization uh, has already been discussed in the sports organizations. But we, what we are introducing is the concept of modernization is part of a governance protocol. So we believe that to transparency and democratic process and accountability work, the, the sporting institutions, they need, to, they need to know how to manage that. So, like, like Greg just told that uh, in the sports organizations, we don't have too much people from the management role or from the business role. So, in most of the cases, these codes of governance that we are used to, they bring some new terms that these people doesn't understand yet. So, when we talk about the modernization in sports organizations, we believe that uh, the staff that is working in these institutions, they need to modernize themselves and the structure of the institution in, to be able to apply these codes of governance in their, in their institutions. I don't know if uh, I answer your question, but we can talk about more later, maybe. In Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> My Spanish is pretty bad. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hello. My name is Anatoly. I'm from Georgia. I have a question to Gregor. You mentioned that uh, you have a, the code with 100 of pages, and it's interesting how it works in practice. Who checks the compliance of the uh, federations? How many people are there? So, and how it works in practice? Thank you very much. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so this is actually a very interesting question because um, when I said there is no actual idea of how to introduce the reform, um, it also applies to who is checking if the uh, NGBs are compliant, because actually there is still the um, conflict um, at the moment inside the um, ministry of who should be checking that, or if it should be one of the organizations, for example, Institute of Sports, which is a research and implementation branch of, um, <coughs> of the ministry, but yeah, the issue is there, who will be checking that, because at the moment, um, we still don't know. Okay, yes, here front, and then we'll come over here. Hi, my name is Ellen. Um, I have a question for Mike. So, the ideas that you came up for the future, they're great and interesting, but I'm wondering in situations where in some developing countries, um, recording of um, corruption and lack of integrity and ethics are not as clear and precise as in some European countries. Do you think the solutions that are formed in developed countries translate into developing countries or are developing countries norm interpreters instead of part of norm creators? Well, it sounded like there were two parts to that yeah. question, and the first part would be better answered by Simon, who is uh, the anti-corruption expert. But if, if I respond to the second yeah. part, I'll give you some thinking time. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the bullet points I've got is networks are critical. And um, that, I think, applies nationally as it does internationally. So although you could point to these vast discrepancies of resources, let's set aside culture, okay, for the moment. Um, some, somebody said to me a couple of weeks ago, you know, most British sport organizations are, are run out of somebody's garage. Uh, how can you compare those to the Premier League in football? 
So my, my, my suggestion there is you, you almost need families of sports to get together and, to be, and for the wealthier uh, uh, football, for example, cricket, athletics, to lead these through. That's one way of doing it based on an economic resource. But in terms of integrity threats, actually, you probably need a different kind of organisation because some sports, because of their, their nature, structure, competition formats, age range profile and so forth, they share similar integrity threats. So a different way to organise is to say which families of sports face the same kinds of problems. Uh, that's, that's complicated, but if you look at the way grooming happens in, in tennis for match fixing, it's a very, very similar phenomenon to sexual exploitation. And, and, and sharing practice with those sports which have very low age profile ranges, where you've hit excellence at a very young level, that strikes me as a strategic way to go about it. So I don't think there's a single model uh, for integrity development. Uh, I think it needs to be happening in different kinds of ways as are appropriate to the resources and the threats of, of the, the agencies involved. In, in terms of international, um, so I'll, I'll lead, in, lead into your answer, okay? So um, I teach engineering ethics right, uh, as part of my day job. And uh, lots of our engineers say, when we try to preserve good governance practices uh, in terms of contractual uh, obligations, we often find when we go to certain parts of the world, these are just thrown out the window, and everybody wants their 10% in a brown envelope. Uh, how do we go about this then? Well, the definition doesn't seem to be the problem here. So I'm not sure it's a conceptual problem, it's a cultural problem. I think there are at least two different definitions uh, of, of corruption, majorly, UNODC, and one other agency that I can't recall off the top of my head. Uh, but they seem fairly clear to me. Uh, culture is the place where we have to start working. And uh, like Dick Pound said earlier, um, it's like inflation, it ain't going away soon, problem of culture. Yeah, I mean, I would, just, just going back to the, uh, the argument about uh, a world sports integrity uh, body, um, I think, uh, you know, there's an emerging awareness that um, top-down solutions are problematic. Um, a notion of uh, a model one-fits-all uh, approaches um, uh, within sport kind of ignores the, the points that Mike has identified uh, uh, across geographical and, and uh, um, countries and different regions of the world. There are clearly different issues. Um, and across sport, um, uh, there are the big sports and there are many little sports. Um, in, in terms of uh, corruption and understanding of, of corruption, I mean, I guess, you know, it's not surprising that in certain countries, um, sport has a more chronic problem around corrupt activity because generally those countries tend to have systematic uh, corruption within uh, public and, 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 and private life. Um, and uh, you know how effectively you engage with that. Uh, again, you know I don't think there is uh, you know one solution. It's it's um, learning about good uh, practices in particular uh, geographical areas within particular sports and, and learning from that and then applying. And um, you know, I go back to the point that, that I made earlier. I don't think sport has been historically very good at listening to what is going on outside. And actually that's a part of the modernization process of having different voices coming in. I mean, in British sport, you go back not that long and the only people that were involved in sports organization, sports administrators, had come from that sport itself. They'd worked their way up through the organization. And the only real skill and quality that they had is that they knew that sport. Um, the process of modernization, as I see it, has been going around at different rates in different you know, countries. Um, and it's about bringing outside experts in who can understand and can challenge and have a dialogue about these issues. And I think that's one of the, you know, the modernization process and bringing other actors in is one of the ways that you can deal with you know, a specific issue of corruption in a particular sport country. I just have one thing onto that, if I may. 
Uh, so uh, I'm not advocating some kind of neo-colonial response, right? That, that the white, well-developed economies can go and help out the poorer ones. I'm not suggesting anything anywhere near as crude as that. Uh, on the other hand, looking at how better resourced sport organisations and countries can help out through their networks is something to be... And it may well be that this is yet another job for something like the UN agency, whether it's UNODC in corruption, whether it's UNESCO in education, UNICRI in terms of the research programme. I suspect the spectre of neutrality, at least, may be necessary here in order to drive the agenda on, but I, I don't think I see anybody from UNESCO, UNODC or UNICRI or other UN agencies here. And that seems to me a pity. Okay, thank you. Let's go ahead to this uh, front row here. Yeah, um, hello, my name is Alan. I'm from the Norwegian School of Sports Scientists. Um, thank you for some really interesting uh, presentations. But can I ask you a question, Denise? <laughs> um, uh, as, I, as, I, as I know, you've been a CEO of uh, US Archery for many years, and now you've changed your position working as a uh, some kind of consultant for uh, federations in the US. What can you learn from research like this? And also, how did you handle uh, change in, in US archery uh, in terms of governance and integrity and so on? Uh, well, thank you for that question uh, and the opportunity to talk about it. Actually, a lot of these topics um, we are interweaving in both the work that uh, the individual NGB in the U.S. is doing as well as the work that I'm doing on behalf of all of them, including standards and an, an enhanced certification program. We're doing a lot more on the, the search for skill sets, so actually hiring outside agencies to help assess where what's the skill set of the current boards at the organization, what are the skill sets of their uh, senior leadership, and actually doing searches to, to look at it in a more hol holistic way. Um, but the ethics piece is a, is a big piece for us at the moment as well. Um, struggling to, to, to determine how much we need independence in that process as sort of an independent ethics committee um, versus individuals who have typically come through the sport, uh, similar to the discussion just now. So um, I think we have a lot to learn, but I, learning from some of the lessons that, from what you're doing in Poland, uh, one of the big efforts we've put a lot of money in and resources against is audit. And we are increasing that. Next year we will be doing annual audits. We've never done that for NGBs. In the past it's always been financial audits, and now we're auditing against governance and a lot of other practices. So um, it's been a lot of work in the last couple of years, but, uh, but we recognize that We've been very sport focused, and we need to be a little bit more well-rounded. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, I think we're just two minutes shy of lunch, so just enough time to get down there. Thank you, thank you to all the panelists, and, and thank you for uh, joining us.